ஹலோ அண்ட் வெல்கம் டு த நியூ எபிசோட் ஆஃப் மெடி டாக் டுடே வி ஆர் கோயிங் டு டிஸ்கஸ் அ வெரி சென்சிட்டிவ் டாபிக் மே பி பிட் நர்வஸ் ஃபார் யூ பட் டோன்ட் வரி டுடே வி ஹாவ் கோட் அ கெஸ்ட் டாக்டர் சத்யஜித் ஹுட்டாய் ஹி இஸ் ஐசியூ ஃபிசிஷியன் அண்ட் ஹாஸ் பீன் ஒர்க்கிங் இன் திஸ் ஃபீல்ட் இன் ஆஸ்திரேலியா ஃபார் மெனி இயர்ஸ் ஹஸ் யூ கேன் இமேஜின் பேஷன்ஸ் இன் ஐசியூ தே ஆர் சீயிங் எ வெரி தின் லைஃப் பிட்வீன் life and death so as their life is hanging on a very thin thread can they trust him no i shouldn't have asked that question uh, dr satyajit uh, he graduated from highly reputed calicut medical college in kerala then he completed his uh, md from trivandrum medical college and then he did his post doctoral fellowship from prestigious sri chitra medical institute in trivandrum Dr. Satyajit came to Australia in 1997 and since then he has been working as an ICU physician for so many years. Welcome Dr. Satyajit to MediTalk. Thank you Dr. Albelius. Yeah, as um, anyone knows ICU is a very uh, sensitive uh, area of care and uh, people might want to know what is happening inside ICU. So what can you tell us about that? intensive care icu uh, is an area of hospital where the sickest patients in the hospital are cohorted uh, they are very intensely monitored through various devices and machines their various function of var- their various organ systems are assessed on a no- continuous and an ongoing fashion they also require much higher level of uh, treatments many of which cannot be delivered in the rest of the hospital so they many of them are on breathing machine for example some of them need dialysis some of them need support for the heart so there is a whole series of things which are done at a much higher level and perhaps much more invasively into the body uh, when i what i mean by invasiveness is uh, sometimes we put certain lines and catheters through the internal blood vessels internal organs including heart and measure the pressures and various th- uh, flow and things like that so these patients are the sickest patients in the hospital yeah very useful to know uh, satyajit and um, so when you say people in icu are monitored so the frequency of monitoring is very high and uh, they have got a doctor available 24 hours am i right of course uh, there is usually in most australian intensive care there is one doctor at least 24 hours and perhaps in medium size hospital there are two and there is usually an icu specialist who is on call 24 hours a day so that term intensive really means it is uh, very very intensive in it, it so that uh, word is there for a reason of course yeah. i mean that okay. is the whole idea you know? okay so what conditions do you normally see in an icu as i mentioned earlier we look after the sickest patients in hospital from all specialties so patients when they are Uh, beyond the capability of a ward or from any area of the hospital they come to intensive care so that could be a medical patient or it could be a surgical patient who has had a surgery or was waiting for surgery sometimes even pregnancy related complications mm. so they may need to come to intensive care as well that's uh, something that many people may not even know or think about yeah yeah very, they are not as common i should say but mm. in adult intensive care we see all the whole spectrum of patients with the breathing problems to kidney failure to um, heart failure various things okay that's good to know now we know that people ending up in icu they are very sick and um, very very unwell but what is um, the likelihood that someone going to icu will come back uh, to normal life or with life itself uh, what is the probability of survival uh, after icu care for example if i go to icu today what's uh, my uh, chance of coming back or among the total number of patients what's the overall survival rate that's a very good question and very common one i should say uh, but the public asks me or acquaintances ask me uh, when you uh, get to know people uh, it is as you would know you working in medicine the a person's a prognosis as we medically say or the chance of getting through an illness depends on a variety of factors 
to at the basic level age plays a part because as we age each and every organ system age as well uh, <clears throat> and uh, then the diseases and and when i say diseases not all diseases of mild nature perhaps not as much but there are certain diseases such as diabetes so a vascular blood vessel diseases the <clears throat> which can affect each and every part of the body so those things depending on the severity and how long they have been present that can affect your organs uh, ability to survive but then either of this age perhaps taking it as an example not everyone at the same age has the same capability of surviving a, a severe illness some people who are run a marathon at 80 whereas majority of the people at 80 would be fairly sedentary in their habits so depending on how active you are uh, or perhaps how good is your functional status how good uh, level are you functioning each and every day uh, your exercise tolerance your ability to how fit you are they all have impact on ability to survive okay so the end result the outcome uh, sometimes depends on how people were before they go to ICU. It's uh, not just um, the care they receive in ICU itself. Absolutely. So, uh, uh, and that is a very good point you raise because that many sometimes even doctors don't tend to understand that even uh, when patients come to intensive care, we usually have a surgeon or a physician who have been looking after them and who would later on look after them once they leave ICU. And many of them, even after having worked in hospital system for many years, they still pay a lot more attention to the, the sudden acute or sudden deterioration and the gravity of that sudden change uh, alone rather than their long-term health. So long-term health of your body plays a big part. Right, okay. But in terms of overall survival rate, um, where um, are the figures? Um, in, yeah, what can you tell us? Uh, I can answer that question in several uh, levels. <laughs> so survival figures, so a person's chance of surviving through any illness is a topic with uh, uh, several dimensions. <laughs> the, the, many a times you say, if you go and ask your oncologist, what is my chance of surviving this cancer? They might say 25%. Now that figure is not necessarily exactly your chance of survival it is actually the percentage of people who would survive if 100 people were to have the same illness as you i'm sure you you as a psychiatrist you are aware of it i'm uh, mentioning it for the benefit of the uh, viewers so from that point of view overall in the world uh, the survival in intensive care range from somewhere between 80 to 85 percent oh that is uh, that is actually uh, very reassuring um, in many ways because oh. um, the traditional concept is that uh, when people go to icu it is uh, just like they are going to the grave so that concept can change I guess uh, it, it, it all depends on how you look at it, isn't it? Like say, so that would still mean that one in six person who come to intensive care would not leave hospital. Yeah. So that yeah. is still, obviously they are the sickest patients in the hospital. And um, then also it is not necessarily just the death alone. It is also how well they are at the end of this when they get home, isn't it? That's what the people want to know, uh, yeah. how good a health I will have at the end of this. That takes us to uh, the next scenario. Where do you think the ICUs in Australia stand in comparison with the rest of the world? Uh, are there any fundamental differences between ICUs in Australia and ICUs in other countries? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, I'd be very proud to answer that question because Australian intensive care stands at the forefront of intensive care medicine oh, in really? the world. Yeah. Uh, in fact, the first specialist training program in intensive care, which is compared to a lot of other specialties like cardiology and respiratory medicine, etc., is a fairly younger specialty. But Australia is, uh, has started that several decades ago, and in fact, first in the world. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah. And in terms of the patient care and the quality of patient care, in several diseases, we have uh, statistically proven that Australian intensive care, the survival and the quality is much better than other intensive care. You asked me about, the, is there any fundamental differences in the way it is done? 
Perhaps Australian intensive care is uh, fairly similar to European and UK intensive care in that we run what we call a close, closed system of mm -hmm. intensive care, closed ICUs. Oh, I never heard of that. Yeah, yeah I'm sure it, a lot of doctors haven't heard about it. Um, and what it means is that uh, a, there is a, an intensive care specialist who's trained in broad ICU uh, and critically unwell patients uh, care who coordinates and uh, primarily does the care for those patients. In, obviously in collaboration with the nurses and the junior doctors and the allied health workers, but also in consultation with the surgeons and the physicians who have, as I said previously, looked after those patients or are going to look after them when they leave ICU. That is quite different to what happens in United States, for example where, as you would know, there is a fairly large commercial and insurance input into the patient care. And so they run what they call an open intensive care, where there are, in many hospitals, have several in intensive care units. And uh, even if it is co-located in one geographic area, the specialists from various disciplines look after their own patients. So there is a fair bit of chaos in, a, in the same intensive care Different Understandably, doctors. yeah, yeah. So that would be a big difference. Now you worked in India uh, for many years, and um, I hope you know your colleagues there. And uh, so, what message do you have for ICU physicians in Kerala, where you worked, or what sort of reforms do you think may benefit ICUs in Kerala? Uh, that obviously that's a question really dear to my heart because having worked in, uh, mm. in my yeah. own country and having worked here uh, intensive care as i mentioned earlier is a much more younger specialty in india uh, even compared to other southeast asian countries and uh, i've had uh, <clears throat> invited uh, uh, meetings in, in indian society of critical care which is uh, oh, intensive yeah. care where I've visited a lot of cities and um, and I've also worked in three different states in India uh, with some understanding of the healthcare. So they, unfortunately in some aspects, we have decided to follow the US uh, fashion of open intensive care, uh, particularly in the uh, large number of private hospitals. So that's one difference. The second is the that overall India spends much lower percent of its GDP on healthcare compared to the rest of the world. You mean out of total budget? Out of the total budget or the gross domestic pro uh, product. So uh, to give you an example, countries like Australia, U UK and uh, Europe spend around 8 to 9 percent of their GDP on health. Um, US spends in, uh, paradoxically more but they uh, less efficient, so they spend 10 to 11 percent, uh, whereas their outcomes are not as comparable to the other developed countries. Uh, in India, spends from what I understood, or from uh, media, is only one to one and a half percent of GDP, and out of which a large percentage comes from private uh, healthcare. So, what we really need to do is to develop our public uh, hospital system, and which would mean intensive care would be part of that that would deliver a much quieter quality of care for patients at the affordable level and uh, which is otherwise not accessible at the moment. So that would be one thing I would like to see. Uh, and a, a gradual change into more closed intensive care and training of both nurses and doctors and other staff members. And overall, more uh, along with that maturing of intensive care, more ethically um, conscious uh, staff in uh, both hospitals and intensive care. Yeah, it is amazing to see uh, Dr. Satyajit's experiences and um, also uh, very interesting to see how intricate the care in ICU system is. Now, I also need to tell you that Dr. Satyajit has completed Master uh, of Public Health. He has a speciality qualification in that area. So that's where his expertise uh, is very, very important. Now, you have said that there are certain differences between uh, ICUs in Australia and the US. Is it true that uh, ICUs in India also are following the same model in the US? Uh, am I right? Yeah. To a large extent. Yes. 
do you think the infection rate in ICU is it, does it contribute to death rates in places like India? Of course, uh, it is a very interesting question because infections in the hospital uh, is something which the public is very puzzled by. We take patients, uh, we take our dear ones to hospitals to get them better and then you're giving them an infection. This is the way they think and you can't blame them. Yeah. But the reality is that in hospitals, when you're cohorting a lot of ill patients, many of them don't have enough immunity, we all carry millions and millions of bugs or bacteria and viruses in our body on a day-to-day -day basis. And there is a balance with them in our body and our immunity is able to maintain that. But when you are unwell, many of them are able to take over uh, the body. And one aspect is the uncontrolled use of antibiotics has been very very much found to be a cause for worsening that situation. So if you give too much antibiotics to patients, you kill a lot of the good bacteria which the body needs, and thereby then the overgrowth of harmful bacteria or harmful other organisms happen. So unfortunately, India is one of the worst offenders in terms of overuse of antibiotics. And in that particular aspect, you can't always blame the doctors alone because in a commercially driven healthcare system like India, the patients are also not very well educated uh, to a large extent and particularly in the healthcare aspects. So yeah. they tend to demand antibiotics as well. But uh, so, do we need antibiotics? Uh, so probably it is the balanced use of antibiotics yeah. that's the way. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So because of that, the secondary infections and antibiotic resistance is one of the worst in the world in our country. Yeah, so, yeah. which is, uh, I hope will change uh, and there are a lot of uh, Indian Society of Critical Care Medicine and a lot of other doctors' organizations and even the Indian government has started an antibiotic policy in the oh, last few that's, years. That's good, yeah. Hopefully they will go a long way. Hope so, yeah. Now, as you know, we run this program for immigrant communities. Sure. Now, from their perspective, going to ICU can be a nightmare because of uh, cultural and language differences. So what provisions are there in ICU to accommodate their cultural and language uh, differences? Uh, are there help, uh, are there, uh, is there help available? Of course there are. Uh, as you would know in healthcare in Australia, is uh, we live in a multicultural society and that is taken into account in the hospital system. The hospitals have got uh, plenty of interpreters and social workers and other people to support them. Uh, that applies in ICU as well. But in terms of uh, getting the families and sometimes the patients through this very emotionally draining and physically challenging times, we take a great care in talking to them as much as possible, uh, definitely daily, sometimes more frequently. And we also conduct family meetings where all the stakeholders from the family can come together and go through a very detailed explanations of the complex condition because many times this are uh, even for doctors is too complex many times for uh, to understand and they we also give them an emotional support we many a times try and explain to them that uh, the chance of survival we occasionally have to uh, hide the gravity of it from the patients but from the families we never hide anything so we actually explain to the families we are very uh, also fairly open about the risks and uh, benefits and also how severe the illness is and how likelihood of uh, getting through this is. But we also provide an emotional support. Very and cool. our nurses are very highly trained as well. And there is generally For one to two patients, there is one nurse. Oh, wonderful, in. yeah. So the other part which may be important for immigrant communities is uh, the, at, uh, access to ICU care. Uh, because I presume ICU care is very expensive and um, for some of the members of the immigrant communities, they may not have Medicare. So in that situation, private health insurance cover ICU care. At any chance, would it be denied to people who do not have Medicare? That's a very um, useful question for the community and I think that's a very um, important one. I'm glad that you brought it up. In general, in Australian uh, hospital system, nobody is denied uh, a very emergency care. Oh, that's, so that's invariably they are, yeah. Yeah, and I'm sure you're aware of it. But 
the ongoing care, there is always this issue, hospitals don't have unlimited funding, so they also have to get some funding from some source. One unfortunate uh, aspect which has happened over the last several decades is that many of these immigrant communities bring their dear ones from overseas for visits. And particularly in India, the insurance industry is fairly a new system. Uh, many of us, um, and I can imagine myself 20 years ago, uh, not very much conscious or aware of the implications. So many people take the lowest level of cover, uh, cover available and sometimes none. So they turn up with very minimal insurance which doesn't cover all this very serious or, uh, illnesses and perhaps the pre-existing conditions are not disclosed or the insurance industry also doesn't ask for them uh, in India. So those covers perhaps won't uh, really deal with all the expenses involved. To give you a rough idea, a, a hospital bed for a day in uh, Australia costs around $750. Mm. Um, a, an intensive care bed costs somewhere around $4,000 to $4,500. It's a huge amount. So that is that is something which can break someone uh, um, financially oh, if yeah. it goes on for several days or weeks. Yeah. So that is one aspect where people I would uh, encourage everyone if they're bringing visitors to bring uh, to have an adequate level of insurance yeah. cover. Yeah. Now, as anyone can imagine, when patients are in ICU, they are not just physically unwell; they are mentally compromised too. And um, long ago, I read I read an article in New England Journal of Medicine by Eric Castle. Uh, its title was. Uh, nature of suffering and goals of medicine. So there he talks about how a person in ICU or, or not in ICU specifically, but in you know, when a person uh, becomes sick, how it changes his life. So uh, when someone is critically ill, uh, he is um, disconnected from family, uh, his routine is altered and um, his representation of society is changed and uh, his political existence is lost. So he doesn't become uh, his uh, self no more. Normally he's a human being uh, with uh, plans and future, he has dreams, uh, he assembles things, wines and unwinds, but during a critical illness, a person in him is diminished. And uh, Eric Castle calls it as a patienthood in the person. So uh, that is a very, a uh, very interesting topic to explore and this is most pronounced in ICU. So what measures are in place to deal with their psychological suffering, sometimes their spiritual needs? As a, as a psychiatrist, I'm sure this is a topic dear to your heart and, um, and I, I must assure you and the uh, viewers that um, we are very conscious of it every minute we work in intensive care with these patients. Uh, being unwell or being ill is really a vulnerable period in your life. And, and it is really worse when you are in hospital and particularly in strange environment, uh, you're physically unwell, you're mentally lost, you, um, you are in pain, there is suffering, and there is uncertainties and question marks in your mind. And to add to this, obviously these are at a much higher degree or level in intensive care. But in intensive care, we also have a lot of tubes and catheters and... Uh, it's uh, a different world altogether, world, yeah. Uh, around the patient, uh, there are a lot of noises, there is uh, a lot of people coming and looking at you. Uh, <clears throat> so it is very bewildering experience. We do take a great care in talking to them all the time, even when they are not able to talk. Uh, as uh, some viewers must have seen, many times they have a tube in their throat going through their mouth, uh, which is connected to a breathing machine. So they are not able to talk while it's in. And that's quite uh, a difficult period. Um, initial period in intensive care, a lot of patients are sedated. So during that time, obviously, they are not aware. But then at some stage, as they get better, we do reduce the sedation and slowly transition them into awake periods. Perhaps usually in the day, day time initially and later on even at night. So that would be an even more challenging. 
We encourage families to be present. We allow there is no visiting time in ICU. So that should definitely help. Help yeah. as well. And we also talk to them, explain to them that you are getting better. We use various modalities in terms of allowing them to um, uh, write. As soon as they are able to taste some food, we allow uh, encourage that. Uh, we use various uh, devices to communicate with them. Uh, the, there are newer drugs which are much more doesn't affect the body as much and the mind as much. Uh, I'm sure you have had patients like uh, what we call delirium is a term and I see a patient's family would hear often or a hospitalized patient's fa family would hear often, which is like an acute confusional state and that is the most traumatic one for the family because this person who was completely mentally normal is now behaving so erratically yeah, yeah. and confused yeah. and Many almost people, like yeah struggle to yes, come into terms, terms with that, with yeah. that. Yeah. and and yeah. when in occasional cases we have even called uh, people like you yeah. to help otherwise we do to, uh, use medications to help with that as well yeah thank you dr satyajit for enlightening us and um, i'm sure uh, people have got a renewed understanding of icu system in australia thank you and um, yeah thank you for spending your precious time with us now there are many more topics to be covered and unfortunately we are running out of time you know things like um, uh, withdrawal of life supports in icu euthanasia and there are many concerns about organ transplantation so i, I do hope that uh, you will come on another occasion and um, again discuss uh, these topics it'll be my pleasure thank you so with that um, that's all uh, for the second episode of meditalk and in the next episode on 30th of January, uh, we will discuss another sensitive topic that is clinical depression. And our guest is Dr. Anoop Ravindran. He is the Director of Mental Health Service in Ballarat. So stay tuned again 30th of January, Saturday at 2 p.m. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to send it to us. Meditalk at m4tv.com.au. Thank you again. Have a good time.